is the King of Glory. Please stand. We'll have to sing this morning um, without music, so we'll do the best we can with our musical ability. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious Heavenly Father, it's good for us to... to uh, come together as uh, believers. We thank you for the common bond that we have because uh, of the common grace that you have shown to us in, in, uh, in uh, calling us to be your children and to make us citizens of your eternal kingdom. We pray that uh, you would give us the big picture of our faith and uh, give us an understanding of who we are. May your spirit draw us ever more to, to greater obedience and to, and to dedicate ourselves to serving you in word, thought, and deed in the short time that you've given to us. We pray that you'd help us not to be consumed by the day-to-day -day affairs and, and neglect your kingdom. Help us not to be overwhelmed by the uh, evil that we see around us, but help us to be uh, uh, aware of the transforming power of your spirit. Help us to be aware of what you have commanded uh, us to do in terms of your certain victory. We ask that you would uh, encourage us. We thank you that your kingdom is growing mm -hmm. and that we are a part uh, of that dynamic. Mm -hmm. We pray that you would uh, uh, encourage us in our walk of faith. We pray particularly for um, those who are traveling. We pray that you'd be with Darlene and uh, Isaac and Melissa and their family. And we uh, pray that you'd be with uh, Dawn and help her to recover from her fall. We ask that you would uh, encourage us, and we pray that you would encourage your church everywhere. We thank you particularly for those saints who are, are, are suffering and, and that their witness uh, to your power to uh, endure. We pray that you would give us a faith that could endure such suffering. Encourage us now in our time together, and we ask that you would accept our uh, feeble words of uh, praise, and we pray that uh, the words that are spoken here would be faithful to your word. In Jesus, our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Well, our first uh, hymn is hymn number 358, For All the Saints. Hymn 358, For All the Saints. We'll sing all six verses. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou wast their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, and their captain in the well-fought fight. Thou, in the darkness, drew their wandering light.
passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's white bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl stream in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia, Alleluia. Our responsive reading is Psalter Selection 60 in our Psalter booklet, Psalter Selection 60 from Psalm 119, the first 24 verses. Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and, and seek, seek him with the whole heart. heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his way. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with that brightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, and I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from my reproach and contempt. For I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. And thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Let's recite together, uh, or um, confess together our faith by reciting together the Apostles' Creed, which is at the front of our Psalter booklet. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from two passages. The first one will be Luke 22 verse 7 through verse 30, Luke 22, 7 through 30, and then we'll be turning to John 13 as well. First of all, Luke 22, beginning at verse 7, our subject is the Lamb of God. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, 
When you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And he shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, that I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. I'm going to pause there. We're now at day five of Passion Week. There are no gospel accounts of the previous day, day four. Day three was the long day when he had the series of discourses against all the uh, various uh, religious and political groups in the temple. At the end of day three, Jesus had said that in two days at the Feast of Passover, he would be betrayed and crucified. In verse 7, we note the preparation for the Passover meal. The Passover meal was eaten in the evening, uh, just after sunset. It, that was, in effect, the, that was the start of the new day, as their new day began at sunset. The preparation, though, had begun earlier that day, because obviously the lamb had to be slain, it had to be roasted, and this took place uh, uh, quite early. So the day of unleavened bread, including the killing of the lamb well before sunset. And so uh, the day actually began with that preparation, and so it was half of the work day, and then work stopped, and the preparations for the Passover began. Verse 7, Luke says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. This is actually the day before the Passover, before sunset. And the day of unleavened bread refers to the day when the, all the leaven, or, that is yeast, or yeast-bearing products, uh, was, were removed from the home. As you recall, that the first Passover in Egypt, in preparation for the Exodus, unleavened bread was prepared. Uh, unleavened bread doesn't spoil, it would last for some time. In fact, unleavened bread, sometimes called cracker bread today, um, can last for months. And then the lamb was slain and the blood was applied to the doorposts of each house. And that meal was eaten with bitter herbs. Now, in the Lord's Supper, there's no lamb. In fact, the people often ask, if this is a Passover meal, why, why is there no lamb? Well, the simple answer to that is Christ is the Lamb of God. Hence our sermon title, The Lamb of God. Um, but why don't we eat lamb at the Passover? We'll be discussing the difference between the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper here as we progress. In verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John to prepare the Passover. And then in verse 13, we're told that they made ready the Passover, that is the Passover meal. Verses 14 and 15 say they then sat down at the Passover. In actuality, they would have reclined at the Passover on cushions around a low table. So these are references to the Passover meal, which included, obviously, the slain lamb. But if you're looking for a lot of details about the Passover meal itself, we don't see them because the emphasis is not on the Passover meal. The emphasis is on the Lord's Supper and the words of Christ. So going back to verse 8, Peter and John were commissioned to prepare everything for the Passover meal. That would have included the unleavened bread, the herbs, and the lamb. Now, some of those arrangements had to have taken place before this time, uh, um, including the arrangements for the lamb at the temple. That probably would have been paid for by this time already. And none of this comes as a surprise to Peter and John. 
the only question they ask Jesus at this time is in verse 9, where? Because they did not know where they were going to celebrate the Passover. Because of this question, it's easy to assume that Peter and John's only job was to find a place, find the upper room. But finding the upper room meant that it did not include the other preparations for the food itself, the meal itself. They didn't just show up to the Passover and find the Passover meal all prepared for them. Those arrangements would have been made. Edersheim, who was a, a Jew who was converted as an adult, is very helpful uh, as a commentator on explaining uh, not just the, the um, biblical procedures, but all the rabbinical additions to it, which he's careful to note Jesus would not have been necessarily uh, anxious to repeat. So some traditions may have been followed, others not, because as we've seen before, when it came to the matter of hand washing, that had been risen to such a, a sacred place, Jesus refused to do the ceremonial hand washing. So some of the traditions may or may not have been followed, but certain, some things are certain. And so we, we see the Passover meal in the gospel accounts in bits and pieces but whether he would have followed the rabbinical additions or not. We have a lot of traditions around every holiday. In fact, families make up their own traditions. So we add traditions to, to traditions. People are encouraged. You often hear people say, oh, make up your own family traditions for the, for the holidays. Still, the lamb had to be slain at the temple. And the arrangement for that would have been made by this time already. And then you had to take the lamb to the place where you were going to celebrate the Passover, and it had to be roasted. So there's some arrangements had to be made. After the crucifixion, there was a period of uncertainty among the disciples. And here we get a bit of a glimpse of why. Jesus was in charge. Hours before the Passover was to be eaten, they did not know where they would partake. They depended on Jesus. He was obviously the leader. He didn't defer to them. He actually was in charge, and they left such last-minute decisions sometime to him awaiting his word. It, it may have been that the, this was a, a matter of secrecy because they did not want to be disturbed. And obviously, two days before, he had some very serious confrontations in the temple with the religious leaders. So for whatever reasons, the disciples don't know where they're going to celebrate Passover until the final hours before it. Jesus told them to follow a man carrying a pitcher of water that they saw. And at the house he entered in, they would go to the master of the house. And the owner was to be told... The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? They were to ask for the guest chamber. But they were told then that they would be shown a large, they were shown a large upper room. The word guest chamber there is kataluma. It's the same word used in Luke 2, 7 to say that Jesus, there was no room in the inn at the nativity. When we were talking about that passage, we noted that that was not what we would think of as an inn or a hotel as it's often depicted. The word kataluma meant the, uh, the common room of the house. In a small village like Bethlehem, uh, it was typically a room on the first level where you entered and it was, and the next level was up a few steps and that lower room was gated off, and at night, livestock would often be brought in there. And so, um, they, this is what's re being referred to. So in Jerusalem, that would have been the common room. It wouldn't have necessarily held livestock in, in the city, but it was the common room that people went into. 
the family would then be in the, in the upper level, or perhaps if there was a second floor, they would have a more private room. And so Jesus says, just ask for the common room when you go into that man. Don't ask for the best room. Now, because of the crowds in Jerusalem, it was very common for more than one Passover to be celebrated in a household. Um, and the reason was that uh, 10 was considered a minimum number to celebrate the Passover. And the maximum was uh, based on the limitations of the lamb. This is early spring, so the spring lambs would have been quite small. This was not a large animal. This was a, a small lamb that was being slain. So the maximum number would have been determined by the, the ability of every participant to take part in the lamb. Now, we're not given any information in the Gospels about the owner and his willingness to uh, prepare a room for Jesus. But it does seem as though this is someone with whom Jesus had made prior arrangements and he had kept it secret. He kept it secret even from the disciples, perhaps because he did not want Judas to know, because he did not want to be betrayed by Judas. Uh, and so Judas didn't know ahead of time. We're told it was for the master. So the man obviously considered Jesus the master. We know that there was a larger group of disciples beyond the 12 that followed Jesus and uh, supported him in different ways. It says, uh, so the, the word master implies that there's a personal relationship to him. He didn't say Jesus of Nazareth has need of the room. He said the master. And the owner did not offer them the catalumna or the common room as you entered the house he offered a large private upper room often the large the upper rooms in houses had their own outside staircase as well so Jesus had kept this location a secret even from the 12 and Peter and John then are told to prepare the meal we're going to get to that shortly but they knew what was involved in preparing the meal. It was, it was commonly known to, to uh, any Jew. And it was likely that the arrangements had already been made. Certainly, the arrangement would have already been made for the lamb itself at the temple. So all they had to go do is go to the temple and get their lamb and then go through the ceremony of having the lamb slay, of, of slaying the lamb there and having the blood sprinkled in the temple, then they would take it. So the only question really that Peter and John had of Jesus was where? Edersheim holds to the tradition that the home uh, actually belonged to Mark's family. Mark, the writer of the gospel. This is we're told later in Acts the house to which Peter went when he was miraculously released from prison. We're told when Peter went to the house there were many gathered there in prayer and it has been speculated not just by Edersheim that this was the same upper room in which the disciples had taken part of Passover and the Last Supper. So it was a relatively large room. This fact compared with the brief comments in uh, Mark's Gospel in Act, uh, point also to the fact that Mark himself was there. In Mark 14, verses 51 and 52, we have an account of the arrest of Jesus in Gethsemane. And Mark briefly points out that a young man who had only a linen covering himself was um, there was an attempt to seize him by the Romans and they took off, his, they grabbed his linen he escaped without his linen cloth and he escaped naked now, what is that all about? the speculation is that that was Mark himself who this, as the speculation goes um Judas, when he returned with the soldiers, 
late at night, found that the disciples were no longer there. And Judas, assuming that they would go where Jesus often went to pray, uh, to Gethsemane, he, Judas said, Let, go to Yosem, uh, Gethsemane, he's probably there. And Mark, this young man was, who was awakened by these so Judas and these soldiers, may have been hurriedly thrown on a tunic and then gone to the garden and objected. And when the, they tried to seize him in the commotion, he escaped. So it's possible that that was the connection. It's also possible then that the, some of the elements, such as the, the wine and the bread, were provided by Mark, uh, Mark's family. But that still leaves the lamb. And it was Peter and John's responsibility to get the lamb. And the lamb could only come from the temple. Now, the temple was not a sanitized museum. The temple was a very bloody place, and particularly on Passover. You had a lot of people. Uh, Josephus said, uh, said that three years before the destruction, which would have been 67 AD, just before the Jewish rebellion, the, they estimated the crowds of Jerusalem for Passover at three million. That's a lot of lambs. It, all the orders of the priests were on duty in the temple at Passover. It was a place of blood sacrifice. Thousands of lambs would have been slain there. The arrangement for a lamb had, would have already been made. Now, if Judas had made that arrangement earlier, perhaps even the previous day, perhaps that's the occasion that he had to go to the temple or make the arrangement when he met with the religious leaders and offered to betray Jesus. The two apostles would have gone back to the temple just two days earlier. Jesus had had these confrontations with all every major group in Jerusalem, scribes, Pharisees, chief priests, all of them had in some way confronted Jesus to try to trip him up. So these had all shown contempt for Jesus. The temple would have been packed with people, and Jesus had predicted that he was going to be betrayed and crucified. So this would have been a very unusual thing for Peter and John to go to the temple with all these mixed emotions about this is the place where Jesus had this great opposition and, a lot, and, and what to make of all these things. What even to make of Jesus' words that he was going to be betrayed and crucified because they still didn't understand how that fit into the whole idea of his kingdom. But they were there to get the lamb that had already been paid for. Now, Peter and John would have slain the lamb themselves. A priest caught the blood in a basin, and it was then passed to other priests who sprinkled the blood uh, on the altar. While all this was going on, Psalms 113 through 118 were being uh, chanted by the priests. Uh, it's called the great halal, which, from which we get the word hallelujah. Some of the lines were repeated by the people. One of the lines repeated by the people was, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And as you recall, part of that great halal had been proclaimed at the triumphal entry of Jesus. Peter and John would then, like many others, carry their slain lamb through the streets of Jerusalem on a pole. Yeah, they would hang the lamb on a pole and, and two men would carry it. And at the home, it would be put on a spit and roasted. Then the Passover supper did not begin until nightfall. And that was officially proclaimed when three stars were visible and 
three blasts of the trumpet from the temple signified that Passover had officially begun and the supper would not begin before that point. Let's now read verses 14 through 30. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called the benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In verse 15, Jesus said, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Notice he connects the Passover with his death. And he wanted to make this clear to them, the connection between the Passover and his death. And that's the meaning, really, of the Lord's Supper. John had said this same thing years earlier. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Then Jesus added in verse 16, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until, I, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then after he gave them wine, he said the same thing again. He won't drink of that until that time. This is refer, referring to the, what's called in Revelation 19.9, the marriage supper of the Lamb. A supper was a time of celebration, a time of joy, just as uh, uh, weddings often have a meal afterwards, it's a time of joy, it's a time of, of uh, a celebration. The marriage supper of the Lamb represents the celebration in the kingdom. And Jesus says, I won't eat or drink anymore until that time when we all celebrate together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. In baptism, the symbolism that we're buried with Christ till he comes again and we rise from the dead and... and in the wine and bread, we look to the supper at the commencement of his kingdom and fellow, that when we fellowship again with him. When the disciples gathered for the Passover meal, there arose a problem. Luke notes this in verse 24 to introduce Christ's words. But it, as Edersheim notes, again, this strife would have actually happened before. There's a lot in, in the gospel accounts that can't be chronological, and we don't always talk chronologically. We sometimes go back and explain something or context. And this discussion about how they would be seated had to have happened almost first thing before they sat down at the Passover meal. The issue was seating arrangement. Seating in rabbinical tradition which was followed by Jews everywhere, represented a matter of rank, honor, uh, of status and distinction. So a priest or a rabbi would be given high prominence. And if you were sitting to the left of the host, that was a, important. 
and then the next post person would be on the other side of the host, and then you would go outward at the table from them. Something like a wedding party usually has the bride and the groom at the center of a table, and then there are attendants, male and female, going out after that. Now, it's easy to assume that in some of these individuals, disciples, sought the honor, but another part of the discussion may have likely been the whole question of by what standard do we gauge how we are to sit? They may have, some of them may have hesitated saying, where are we supposed to sit and how do we determine that? And they looked to Jesus and some said, well, is it by age? Is it by position? Uh, seniority as being a disciple? How do we, how are we going to sit here? In other words, Passover had a lot of traditions, and, and how you were seating would have been one of them. What is certain is that they thought it was important. We're, now let's read, before we go any further, John chapter 13, the first 30 verses. John 13, beginning at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. And he, For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. For after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send that receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus, had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spoke, spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. And then lying, and he, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Simon, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, thou, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Now, 
again, this can't be chronological because in uh, verse 2 of chapter 13, it refers to the supper being ended, and then the su supper is described in verses 23 through 30. And again, I'm, I'm indebted to Edersheim, really, for his classic study uh, of these things. They were laying around a table, and they were reclining on cushions around a central table. They were probably arranged in a sort of a horseshoe, because it would have been common practice for the food to be at one end and then the host to, 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 to go around them. So the host had access to the, uh, the bread and the wine and the lamb. Verses, uh, in verse 23, we're told that John leaned on Jesus, uh, so he was to the right of Jesus. John never refers to himself by name. He always refers to himself as the one Jesus loved or that other disciple. He always refers to him as in the third, himself as in the third person. So John could have very easily spoken very quietly to Jesus and Jesus to him. In Matthew 26, 25, we're told that Judas asked Jesus specifically if he was the one that Jesus was accusing, and Jesus answered J Judas in the affirmative. Yet, John says none of the other disciples were aware of that conversation. So Judas must have also been very close to Jesus, so Judas was probably to the left of Jesus, which was the seat of honor. You see, that was this, the, the, the place of highest honor. Judas, in fact, did hold a position of authority amongst the disciples. He was the treasurer. So, this would also explain why Judas was the first to receive the sop, which was part of the Passover meal. We'll get to that shortly. Peter, then we're told, asked John to ask Jesus about who he was referring to. So Peter was obviously not as close to Jesus, and he was either to John's right or across the table from John where he could whisper over to, to John to, you know, to have something uh, explained and ask Jesus that Peter obviously could not do confidentially. It's, and it's also possible Peter took a position further away from Jesus after Jesus' admonition to serve others. But Jesus was acting as the host, the server. And he wouldn't have been held, um, bound by rabbinical traditions, including hand-washing, which was one of the traditions at Passover. So, after the blessing on the wine, there would have been a ceremonial hand washing. Instead, what we have in the gospel accounts is a foot washing. Now, foot washing was typically done by servants. And this is why Peter objected to Jesus playing the role of a servant, a slave. That was beneath Jesus in Peter's thinking. Um, and this whole foot washing was really a, Jesus' was answer to the whole question of seeking pr prominence. And in retrospect, what Jesus said about not seeking prominence, it would have really stuck in the disciples' minds if the person with the seat of prominence at the Last Supper and the Passover was really Judas. Because Judas at the Passover had the place of prominence, apparently. After Christ's exchange with Peter, none of the other disciples questioned the propriety of Jesus washing their feet. Jesus said, you call me Master and Lord. Those are titles of great respect and honor. So Jesus, they obviously regarded him with honor, but they said, now, if I'm willing to do this, this is what you should do for one another. This is an example, not a ritual that you are to follow. The point was, you be a servant to others. You serve others in the community of faith. They were, this was an object lesson. Now, Jesus noted that he didn't speak of them all. And so he made clear to the disciples that he knew that 
who was going to betray him. But he didn't openly say who that was. To do so would have been to precipit interrupt the meal with a confrontation of the eleven against Judas. But reflected on later, what did that tell the eleven? Jesus is fully in charge. He knows who's going to betray him, and he allows him to go do it. But Jesus did this voluntarily. He went to his death voluntarily. See? Jesus drew them together in an act of love, explaining, this is how I want you to treat one another. Because something else you'd have to think about is if this betrayal just came unbeknownst to them and Jesus hadn't let them know that I know who's going to betray me, there would have been suspicion amongst the other 11 that were remaining. Well, is there another betrayer in our midst? Is there someone who may have cooperated with Judas in this act? Instead, Jesus bound the 11 together with an act of devotion, says, I want you to treat each other this way. So that prevented any accusations of complicity with Judas later. During the Passover meal is when the disciples uh, anguished over who would betray Jesus. Jesus identified his betrayer as the one to which he gave Sop. Now, Sop, according to Edersheim, was lamb wrapped in unleavened bread, and then it was sometimes dipped in, uh, um, in uh, something made of nuts and fruit. But that's where the lamb comes in. So the sop, according to Edersheim at the time, would have included the lamb. So lamb isn't mentioned at the Passover, but that's where it would have come in. Again, the point is not to describe the Passover meal that was commonly known to everybody at the time. The point was the words of Jesus and what the implications were as to who Jesus was, which is why we have the Lord's Supper. Identifying Judas with a sop probably wasn't a conclusive identification because Jesus would have then given it as the host to all of them in turn. That's why Judas asked himself, are you referring to me? And Jesus told him to go do what he was going to do. Judas, having partaken of Passover, then left. Other disciples assumed he went out on some official business to prepare the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed Passover. Then after the Passover meal, with Judas now gone, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And of course, there's no lamb in it. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. The wine and bread would have been still on the table from the Passover meal. The, and that was traditional according to Edersheim that you had wine and, then, and bread and then you had more wine and bread later. So the wine and the bread would have still been on the, on the table. Now Jesus identifies these two remaining elements of the Passover because they were required to consume the lamb. The lamb was all eaten at the Passover meal, but the wine and bread remain. Jesus says, these represent my body and blood. So that was the last legitimate Passover meal. To slay a lamb was to represent the need for blood atonement. Now the real lamb was about to be slain. And we remember his finished work for us. The Lord's Supper has often been called throughout history as a Christian Passover for this reason. So the Passover meal, it wasn't described here in detail. There are just bits and pieces of it. But the emphasis was on Christ's words and on the new institution about how we look back at this, the Lamb of God who was slain for us. John's Gospel does not mention it. John's Gospel was written later, 
and he filled in a lot of the blanks. He's going to go into extensive detail about what Jesus said uh, in the upper room and on the way to Gethsemane. But he doesn't mention it. Paul, however, describes it. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians 10, and he refers to it as a communion of the blood of Christ and communion of the body of Christ. And then he mentions it again in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 11, when he repeats the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper, the words that are most often quoted in the Lord's Supper. So there are four accounts in the New Testament of the Lord's Supper. But in the Lord's Supper, we eat the bread and wine because we live when we consume food. We have to consume food in order to live. And we eat the bread and wine to say, we take to ourselves the Lamb of God, His body, His blood, and that's how we live. So we don't slay a lamb in the Christian Passover. We remember the Lamb of God who was slain for us. And that we will drink with him and eat with him, which tells us something about eternity. I often tell people, you know, heaven is a real place. Our bodies will be raised from the dead, physical bodies. They'll be changed. But there's going to be eating and drinking in heaven because you can't have much of a a marriage supper without food and there's going to be food and wine in heaven so it's going to be a place of joy and of celebration and that is when the ecclesia the bride of christ join their head in the marriage supper so the feast represents that time of celebration and the communion of those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we are nothing without uh, your gift of salvation to us that comes to us through the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that all we have is because of what you have done for us. And we pray that you would give us a greater sense of who we are we acknowledge that we often fail you in word and thought and deed. We often think our lives and, and our, our mundane activities are the sum total of our lives and we become consumed by our day-to-day -day activities. Give us a constant sense of, of the enormity of who we are and our obligations to you, to you in, in terms of what you have done for us. We pray that you would lead us to greater faithfulness Help us to obey you so that in some small way we might further your kingdom. Help us to stand in terms of, of that kingdom in, in everything we do and to structure our whole lives about serving you with gladness. And we look forward to the time when we do celebrate with our, our Lord and, and Savior in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We, we pray that you give us the joy of your salvation and give us hearts and uh, hands that are willing to, to serve and to work for you as, as you're faithful. We ask this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn, then, is hymn number 92. Hymn 92. Let us stand and sing all four verses of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Almighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood, a mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. 
Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Just ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is He. Lord Sabbath of his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God of darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to And now go in peace. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you, guide and protect you this day and always. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world.